but Eric Lesser is here. So um, I don't want to keep him waiting too long. So let, let us introduce our own Molly Trowbridge. Works for him, I believe. So Eric, where are you? <laughs> I'm here. Can you see me? Okay, yeah, now I can see you. Yes. We have more than 25 people. So, you know, some people disappear. Um, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm uh, ready when you are. are you... You're all set. The, oh, the oh, perfect. All right, good. Well, it's uh, I'm excited to be in uh, in uh, in um, Mansfield for a few reasons. One of which is, as you mentioned, Deborah, it's the hometown uh, of my uh, communications director, uh, Molly. And I, the joke I would give is, um, we all kind of work for Molly. So uh, when she said <laughs> show up in Mansfield at this time, I said absolutely. And I, I want to give a shout out also to uh, her dad, Mike, uh, who's been helping me and um, is. Uh, is a great friend as well. And I thought what I would do is, you know, maybe just share a little bit about me and my background and a little bit about what I would like to do as Lieutenant Governor. Uh, and then I'd love to, you know, just kind of take questions and, and have a little bit more of a conversation with everybody if that's okay. Um, but uh, don't, don't hold it against me. Uh, I was actually not born in Massachusetts. Uh, I was born in Queens, New York. Um, my dad grew up in uh, the Bachelder Street housing projects in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, in southern Brooklyn. A lot of the people he grew up with uh, had tattoos on their arm uh, that survived the Holocaust. Uh, my mom uh, grew up in Little Italy in New York in Manhattan, uh, in lower Manhattan. She lived in a third floor walk up uh, and shared a bed with her grandmother until her mid-20s when she moved out. Uh, my parents met at City College in New York, uh, which at the time was described as a working man's Harvard. Uh, it was a, a basically free school. They paid $54 a semester. Uh, when we think about debates about, you know, the cost of college now or, or ideas that kind of sometimes get dismissed as outlandish, like free college or free community college, they didn't go to school that long ago, even adjusting for inflation. Uh, we're asking kids today and their families to pay quite a lot more uh, than what they paid. Uh, we moved to Western Massachusetts because that's where the jobs were uh, and that's where the opportunity was for my family. I grew up in Longmeadow, uh, about 70 miles or so, 80 miles or so from where all of you are. And the first time I ever got involved in politics, I was 16 uh, and the principal at our high school, my public high school, called us all in for an assembly uh, and lined a whole bunch of teachers up at the front of the room. Uh, and told us that those teachers weren't coming back next year uh, because of budget cuts that had been made in the building I now work in. I remember sitting there and feeling really angry uh, that a bunch of 14 and 15 and 16 year olds were being asked to pay the price for bad decisions, frankly, that had been made somewhere else. Uh, so we went out and we organized. Uh, we organized a Proposition two and a half uh, override campaign. I'm sure many of you <laughs> on this call have been involved in those efforts. You know, we went, knocked on doors, handed out leaflets, did all the things you do in an effort like that. And I remember sitting in the town hall uh, when the vote was being counted uh, and the clerk announcing that the vote had passed. And one of the teachers was, had been sitting next to me and she had been clutching a pink slip as they were counting the ballots. She literally ripped the pink slip up and threw it in the garbage because the vote passing meant her job had been saved. It was an, an early lesson for me uh, that despite the messiness and the frustrations of politics, and there's a lot of frustrations in politics, it still remains one of the most powerful ways to make a difference. And I know all of you, uh, all of us probably feel that way, or we wouldn't be uh, doing the work we do uh, day in and day out. So from there, I caught the bug, uh, and I got wrapped up in the campaign of this skinny guy with a funny name from Illinois, uh, Barack Obama. My big break for him uh, was carrying all his suitcases around New Hampshire during the first in the nation primary. Uh, I ultimately traveled with him to 47 states and six countries uh, and ended up working about 40 feet from the front door of the Oval Office as the assistant to David Axelrod, who was the president's senior advisor at the time. Uh, I was there for the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I worked closely with Elizabeth Warren and her team on the passage of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I was there for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, met LeBron James, uh, met the starting lineup of the Red Sox. There were, there were definitely perks to working there, uh, but I was eager to get home. Uh, and the reason I wanted to get home was because President Obama told me to go home. Uh, he told his young aides that 
you know, if you were frustrated with how things were going, or if you were frustrated with your community, feeling like it was getting left behind, to grab a clipboard and go run for office yourself. Uh, and that's what I did. Uh, and for the last eight years, I've been working on a set of issues, and Molly has been involved in a lot of these that is vital for all of us and vital for Mansfield and issues that I'm committed to moving forward with uh, as Lieutenant Governor. Uh, at the height of the pandemic uh, back in 2020, uh, when you remember our, our small businesses were shut, their doors were closed, they couldn't see customers, they couldn't bring in income. I led the effort to get more than $600 million out in small business aid to our smallest businesses. We wrote into the legislation that the money first had to go to minority owned businesses, immigrant owned businesses, and those in our lowest income zip codes. We helped keep open hundreds of barber shops, nail salons, dry cleaners, daycare centers, bodegas uh, in every corner of our state, saving tens of thousands of jobs. People remember Massachusetts unemployment rate hit 20% or almost 20% at the height of the shutdowns in the spring and summer of 2020. As the opioid crisis raged, and I know Mansfield's been hit very hard from opioids, as has my communities in Western Mass. I led the effort to get a Narcan bulk purchasing program passed. Mansfield is a participant in that program. We've brought the price of Narcan down by more than two thirds. For people who might not be familiar, Narcan reverses an overdose. If a school nurse or an EMT shows up at the site of an overdose and has Narcan, the person is likely to live. If they show up and they don't have Narcan, it doesn't go so well. We helped get thousands of doses of Narcan into the hands of police, firefighters, EMTs, school nurses, daycare and camp counselors, athletic center directors, and anybody else who might come in contact with the public or someone who might overdose. And it has quite literally saved hundreds of lives, according to a DPH report that came out last year. And for the last eight years, I've been working on an issue that I'm committed to getting done as Lieutenant Governor which is connecting our entire state by rail from Pittsfield and Springfield through Worcester, through Framingham and over to Boston. Why would this project matter for Mansfield? Uh, well, first of all, it would be the single biggest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions our state has ever undertaken, taking thousands of cars off the road and cleaning our air. It would also create thousands and thousands of units of new housing, especially in areas of our state you know, where it's just impossible to live. I peeked at the, um, at the Zillow listings in Mansfield just before jumping on because I was curious and my eyes exploded. I mean, I don't know how people afford it and I don't know how families and young people are going to afford it if we don't get costs under control in our state. We need rail service. We need the housing that rail service and mass transit brings, especially the transit-oriented development, denser housing that's walkable and that's clean. And finally, it would create thousands and thousands of really good, really high paying jobs, especially in areas of our state that have been left out of Boston's high tech and life sciences boom. I just wanna quickly also talk about the governor's council uh, because this is a part of the Lieutenant Governor's portfolio that often doesn't get brought up, but is actually really important. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor chairs the governor's council, which of course is the body in our state that confirms all judges nominated and appoint, or excuse me, appointed, nominated uh, by the governor. Uh, this role, frankly, I think has been underutilized uh, and under leveraged by Lieutenant Governors for a long time. And I'm committed to changing that. Uh, I have a Harvard Law degree. I'm the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. And when I worked for President Obama, I worked on two Supreme Court nominations uh, for Sonia Sotomayor and for Elena Kagan. And I'm committed and dedicated to making sure that as chair of the Governor's Council, we're using that position to promote our criminal justice reform priorities and to promote a diverse judiciary. Uh, I think we need more racial diversity among our judges. We need more gender diversity. We also need more geographic diversity. I wanna see more judges from the Southeastern Mass and from the Merrimack Valley and from the Cape and from the South Coast and from Western Mass represented. For a while, the entire SJC and the appellate court had no uh, judge from West of Worcester, uh, which is not right. It locks entire regions out of representation. We also need more diversity of experience. 
I do give Governor Baker some credit for some, some good appointments he's made, especially recently, but he's appointed too many prosecutors. We need more public defenders. We need more public interest lawyers. We need more environmental lawyers on the bench uh, as well. And so I'll just close before we go to questions by saying, you know, look, I get it. I know what the job is of Lieutenant Governor. It's to be the partner to the governor. It's to support the governor and to make sure the governor's agenda is a success. And I think I bring the right mix of skills and experience uh, to be that partner for our governor and to make sure that our collective democratic agenda is a success and is implemented in our next administration. Um, and so I'm really excited uh, to get to work on it. And uh, I'm really excited to be in the hometown of, of Mali. And uh, I would love to just have a little bit of a conversation with everyone. And I would, I would humbly ask for your consideration and your support uh, as we get ready for the convention in June. Okay, thank you. Um, can we have some questions for Eric, please? Um, actually, I need to go back to, I didn't switch this view, did I? Maybe I did, okay. Never mind. I'm talking to myself. Um, I couldn't no, see. No, that was me. You, you okay. <laughs> All right. I switched back so I could see if there anybody had their hands up. Um, any questions for Eric? Do you? Okay. And Antonia? Thanks. Hi, Eric. I'm Antonia Blen, resident here in Mansfield. Um, I've asked each of our candidates who've come in pretty much the, the same question. So I'm curious for your response to this question as well. Um, as you know, the pandemic has affected our communities, our individual lives, how we continue to live. Um, and the, so I'm curious what you may have done differently uh, if you'd had the opportunity to be responsible for the response to the pandemic. So what might you have done differently or would you do differently um, in a role like Lieutenant Governor? I, I really appreciate that uh, that question, Antonia, and it's a, it's an important one, and it's one I've I've thought about and grappled with, and uh, I see Molly smiling because we've been uh, very very engaged in this uh, for a very long time. So just a couple things. So first of all, um, you know I I'm not gonna you know hit hit Baker over the head for for no reason. I mean there were a lot of things that that he did and that the state did do well, uh, and I think it's important not to. Not to overstate that, especially when you see what some other states grappled with, but there were a lot of things that were not done well. Um, so first, the initial vaccine rollout was a disaster uh, by basically any metric and, you know, independent analysts gave Massachusetts an F basically and made, we were one of the worst states in terms of the rollout of the vaccine. And part of it is because the administration took an attitude of feeling that they knew better than the providers on the ground, uh, how to get the vaccines out to people in an efficient and in an equitable way. So just give you an example of this, um, you know, in the beginning, uh, they announced, of course, uh, Gillette Stadium and Fenway Park as two of the distribution sites for the vaccines. There wasn't a single site west of Worcester uh, in, the initial, uh, in the initial rollout and announcement. There was no site on the Cape. Um, they announced a website, you know, where people could go to uh, book appointments. They didn't stress test the website to make sure that it would actually be able to handle the traffic uh, of everyone trying to log on. And of course, it crashed, which led to a lot of unnecessary stress for people uh, and confusion. And um, when they did kind of open sites, uh, I think they were heavy handed and, and they were frankly a little arrogant about how they did it and they didn't work enough with local providers. So I'll just give you one example from my neck of the woods in Springfield. Uh, they put the uh, mass site after we finally convinced them to get a mass vaccination site going at, uh, at an abandoned department store on the far outskirts of the city, more than an hour bus ride from the lowest income communities that needed that site the most totally, totally inaccessible and, and frankly, almost impossible for those communities to access. And <clears throat> there was no reason for it because there's a tier one 900 bed massive medical facility uh, right in downtown that was ready to go and had the resources to, to, to do the vaccines uh, themselves, Bay State Hospital. So I think what I would have done is um, been a little bit humbler about listening to communities uh, and being responsive to what communities were telling us, in particular local boards of health uh, and local um, healthcare providers who are in the business of treating sick people every single in their own neighborhoods every single day. Um, and I would have been a little bit more consistent about communication. 
Uh, Cause I know like our school boards, for example, our local public health boards were dealing with just very conflicting and dizzying information that would often change day to day. Some of that was the nature of what we were all dealing with, which was new and, un and unprecedented, but some of it was a lack of, I think, proactive thought about how you work as a partner to local communities uh, and to local providers. And I think as Lieutenant Governor, you're really like all, the ultimate constituent services person for the state, right? Because the governor's up here, you know, setting the agenda and the Lieutenant Governor should really be in the communities, working with the mayors, working with the um, healthcare providers, working with the local officials um, day in and day out on getting some of those issues solved. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, any other questions for Eric? Hello. Okay, yeah, Bob. I was just wondering, uh, I would vote, gladly vote for Eric as lieutenant governor. However, I'm totally against Mara Healy being the only candidate for governor right at the moment, because I don't think Mara Healy should be a governor after what she, her thoughts and feelings about animal care. She didn't do anything about the Westport farm for animals okay, uh, in okay, Westport, well, so I, I don't now think- Now is not really the time to talk about that, Bob. And actually, uh, Sonia Chang-Diaz is also running for governor. Oh, um, so. good. Okay. All right, thank we, you. We all have opinions on, on different candidates, but I don't really want to get into that because we could be here all night. Um, all right, so if there are no more no questions problem. for Eric. Um, we will move on to, um, okay, Barbara? Yeah, I actually, I actually oh, I have- Go ahead. Actually, I have two questions, um, but one is just to follow up on Eric on what you said about commuter rail being good for the environment. What else would you envision doing to help fight climate change in the state? Oh, that that little topic. Now, <laughs> thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, so, so first, I, I I do think it's important. Um, you know, don't we shouldn't minimize the role that transit will and has to play in, in climate. 40% uh, of our state's emissions uh, come from transportation, uh, the vast majority of that from cars. So it's, it's obviously not only rail, but we also have to electrify our rail. We have to electrify the existing MBTA infrastructure. And we've also got to continue to move uh, to more electric vehicle adoption. We had a major piece of legislation we did in the Senate recently uh, around EV adoption, and we've got to really make sure that that gets implemented uh, and really and really happens. Another very big area and an area I've been doing a lot of work on recently is around buildings, uh, because after transportation, the single biggest uh, source of emissions is, is buildings, and in particular residential buildings, uh, heating and cooling residential buildings, uh, and the construction uh, and maintenance of buildings. Uh, and there, I think we do have a lot more work to do. I've been a big fan of the Mass Save program, but it needs to be dramatically scaled. Uh, and we need to do uh, significantly more around, uh, I have a bill, uh, for example, around home energy audits. So this would be something like the way you have a miles per gallon sticker for a car, you would have some type of miles per gallon or not miles per gallon, but um, you know, efficiency rating for a house that would be transparent. You know, it would be a known at time of sale. Um, so people would be able to know how efficient their homes were. And it has to be matched with incentives and support to do the transitions for these homes, whether it's transitioning to solar, transitioning heat pumps, doing insulation work, that kind of thing. The other thing, um, and this is a little bit off topic, but it is related to climate change, uh, is actually the role that our vocational schools and our technical schools can play. We need a lot of electricians to install all of these solar panels, we need a lot of plumbers to update an HVAC techs to update heating and cooling systems. Uh, we need carpenters to do um, the, 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 the improved insulation work. And we are nowhere close to uh, having the capacity right now uh, to be able to do that at anywhere near the speed or scale we have to do it um, to meet the climate goals that we have to set for ourselves. So um, this is, I actually think, an opportunity to bring other communities in that have maybe not been part of the, um, you know, the climate discussion, say like, let's get the training program set up at our community colleges. Let's get um, the, the training programs and the apprenticeship programs set up at our high schools. Uh, in order to do this. Um, and the, la the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll also add is um, we really need to do a lot 
uh, to center uh, environmental justice. Uh, we, I've had a lot of experience with this. Unfortunately, people have maybe followed the fight we've been in around the biomass facility in Springfield. Uh, this, so for, <laughs> for people that don't know what biomass is, it's the, the, the plant in Springfield, just to give you a sense of this, would have burned 1,200 tons of wood chips an hour, uh, something like that. Uh, and it would have brought a thousand truck trips uh, every single day in and out of this facility 24 seven in basically incinerating pellets of wood. Instead of burning coal, they burn wood. And because wood is quote unquote renewable, uh, it's classified for subsidy under the state's current um, renewable energy guidelines, which, by the way, the Baker administration has been weakening. Uh, and so uh, we have had an effort now going for multiple years to get this facility blocked. I have legislation to just pull out biomass from the list of of um, of, uh, of power of power sources that are eligible for state subsidy. And this is the example of a kind of thing that a Lieutenant Governor can move the needle on because we're battling DOER right now over these regs. It's very complicated, it's very technical, very fast. But frankly, by moving a piece of paper, Baker and Polito could end this by re reinterpreting how, um, uh, how biomass, uh, or excuse me, how the uh, DOER regulations work. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, when we have a democratic governor, when we have a democratic administration, we're gonna have a lot more leverage and a lot more resources at hand to be able to move the needle on these topics. I mean, I know I'm only scratching the surface of, of what we need to do. I've been a big offshore wind proponent, even though I'm inland. Uh, you know, I believe strongly in, in, in offshore wind and, and in the potential it's got for our state. Uh, and um, uh, we've done a lot also in, in Western Mass around renewable forestry and protecting uh, protecting old growth forests and acknowledging the role that you know, our, our protected open spaces play and also in, car in capturing carbon. Okay, great, thank you. All right. Sorry, I know there's a little bit of a mouthful. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, and best of luck to you. Um, we, you. Shannon, we have another speaker tonight, so I want to need, and we need to move it along. Shannon Liss Riordan. Hi, Eric. She is hey, running. Scanlon. For... See ya. Have a good night. Um, is Shannon no. here? I saw her a minute ago. I let her in. Where is she now? Bye, Lois. There she Eric. is. Okay. Hi, I'm here. Okay, great. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Mansfield Democrats. It's great to see you tonight. My name is Shannon Liss Reardon. I am running to be your next Attorney General. I have spent my career taking on the biggest challenges and delivering big results for regular people. I've spent my entire legal career using the law as a tool to improve people's lives. For the last 23 plus years, my whole legal career I have represented working people. I've made national headlines, leading teams of lawyers, taking on some of the largest corporations in America. And time and again, we've beaten the odds. We have won against corporations like Starbucks, FedEx, Amazon, Uber, IBM, my alma mater, Harvard University, which I have proudly sued at least four times. I have represented all types of working people from waitresses to construction workers, to janitors, to firefighters, to Uber drivers, to strippers, and helped them recover hundreds of millions of dollars that corporate America stole from them. This work has changed industries across Massachusetts and throughout the United States. And I am very proud to have dedicated my career to fighting for the people against the powerful and winning which is exactly what I plan to do for you as your next attorney general. I know how to use the legal system to make progress on some of the toughest issues facing us from fighting race discrimination to standing up for gender equality to protecting the dignity of work. I think that Massachusetts needs a champion in the attorney general's office. I, I know that people of Massachusetts could really use a win right now. Income inequality is at an all time high. Corporate bad actors are taking advantage of workers, of consumers, and our planet. Unions and the right to organize are under attack. Parents are having to choose between childcare and putting food on the table. 
and the United States Supreme Court is on the verge of taking away nearly 50 years of reproductive freedom. Um, people need a champion. Uh, as I said, the work that I have done has changed industries. And I want to give you just one quick example. Um, early on in my legal career, back in the early 2000s, I started getting calls from wait staff employees who were complaining that their managers were taking their tips. Now, these were hardworking people who, who paid the rent, they put food on the table, they supported themselves and their families based on the generosity of the public they served but their, their bosses were reaching into their pockets and, and taking away their income by, by taking from their tips. And I knew that that was wrong. So I started taking on these cases. I did it based on this old law that I found on the books that had been passed in Massachusetts in 1952, but it just sat there, never really been used. No one really paid much attention to it, but um, I, I, I took it on, I started taking these cases, and before I knew it, I was getting calls from wait staff across Massachusetts. Uh, before I knew it, I had sued just about the entire hotel and fancy restaurant chain industry. Um, so that first case that I took all those years ago, I lost. Um, but I didn't let that stop me, I kept going. And so in the next case, I lost that one too. But I still didn't let that stop me or deter me. I kept going. And the next case, I won. And then the next case, I won. And then the next case, and the next case after that. And before I knew it, that string of cases changed the service industry in Massachusetts and established the law that tips are for workers, not for owners. Um, my success in this area then spread nationwide. And now there is not a hotel or a restaurant or an airline or a gig economy company that thinks they can get away with taking workers tips because they know if they try it, I will come after them. So that's, that's one example of the kind of challenge I've taken on. I say I don't take in my legal practice. I haven't taken on just cases or just companies. I've taken on industries and I've fought industry practices um, and, and successfully. And over the last decade, I have been focused on taking on um, abuses by the, the so-called gig economy, companies like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Grubhub, um, which have claimed that they don't need to provide any worker or wage or labor protections to their vast workforces. Um, uh, the work that I've done in this area sparked a national conversation about the needs of these workers to be protected by our wage and hour and employment laws. Um, it's a long story. I'm happy to answer questions about it, but it's led to a, a ballot initiative we're fighting this year. I've been working closely with the AFL-CIO over the last year to try to stop um, the, the big tech gig economy companies from trying to carve themselves out of the law here through an incredibly expensive ballot campaign they're launching. They're going to put out hundred million dollars in to this campaign to try to buy themselves a law here. Anyway, those are the kinds of battles I've taken on. I, um, as I've been traveling around the state talking to folks about my campaign, I have been asking everyone to consider this to be really a job interview. You're hiring the next lawyer for the people of Massachusetts. I am, um, I ask you to consider my, my background, my skills, my experience, my passion and my unparalleled record in delivering meaningful change when you're deciding who you want to have as the next lawyer for the people of Massachusetts. I'm the only candidate in this race who's represented working people. I am the only practicing lawyer. I'm the only candidate in the race who has run and managed a law firm. And the Attorney General's office is a major public interest law firm for the people. I have won the jury trials. I have won the appeals that have shaped our law to better and more fairly serve the people. I, I've been an activist lawyer through my whole career, going back to my days as a women's rights organizer and activist, which I did right out of college. I, I learned that from working with the legendary Bella Abzug, who I love to call out on this day after International Women's Day. Um, I have been working essentially as a private attorney general for the last 20 years, and now I'm ready to take my service to the next level with the power of the state behind me. I am very proud to have received a, the endorsements of a long and growing list of labor unions. I have been called the workers champion and now I'm ready to be your champion, Massachusetts champion.
So my name again is Shannon Liss Reardon. I am running to be your next attorney general. I, I humbly ask for your support in this campaign. You can read more about the campaign and, and, and join us at our website, which is shannonforag.com. Um, don't know how much of my time I took up here tonight, but I'm, but I'm eager to hear what's on your mind and answer some questions that you might have for me. So thank you so much, Mansfield Democrats, for letting me speak to you tonight. All right, great. Um, so do we have any questions? Thank you, Shannon. Um, do we have any questions for Shannon? Yes, one. Okay. Okay, Bob. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to know how how strong she would be on animal rights. Um, I'm a big animal lover. Um, I think it's I think it's important. Um, we've got um, <laughs> our 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 Airedale Terrier is a part of our family. Uh, my law partner is is has a lot of animals on a on a farm. Um, um, a, a big support. I've got a couple of vegans in my household. Um, I'm semi-vegan myself. So anyway, it's a big, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in animals. Thank you. Okay. Um, other